Hello friends, welcome to Un Academy. Let's crack neat PG. I'm Dr. Shonali Chandra and in today's session we will be taking up our discussion further uh, when we've been discussing placenta so far. Now we'll talk about the endocrinology of pregnancy and lactation. So we're going to talk about the pregnancy hormones in this session. I've highlighted my referral code here which is S-H-O-N-A-L-I. You can download the Unacademy learning app as well on your mobile phones. On the Unacademy uh, subscription platform, you'll get daily live classes where you can chat with your educator, ask your doubts and queries, and it's like a live classroom session. Uh, the courses are structured keeping in line with the latest NEAT PG syllabus. There are also live tests and quizzes on the platform which you can undertake to help you evaluate your performance as you go along. And most importantly, one-time subscription gives you an unlimited access. So you can watch all the live sessions from all the faculties who are active on the platform. And even if you miss out on the live sessions, you can always go back and watch the recorded work versions from the comfort of your own devices. Top educators are associated with the platform and every now and then you know comprehensive uh, batch courses as well as short duration crash courses they keep getting launched so you can check out the ongoing courses in the platform as well. Now the upcoming batches for the NEAT PG examination have already started from 14th of January you can check them out there's a target batch for FMGE there's also a target batch two target batches actually starting for next 2020 and uh, there's an unacademy combat upcoming coming on 24th of January 5 p.m. It's going to be a 60 minute session uh, where you will have to undertake 45 super questions which are curated to match the latest exam trends. Detailed video solutions will also be provided. They will deal with pharmacology, pathology, forensic medicine and anesthesiology. And there is a, a new module of subscription now which is available which is called as the Iconic subscription which allows you to access an academy and prep ladder at the same time. Now you can take this Iconic subscription for 12, 18, 24 or 36 months duration and if you subscribe using my code then you can avail an additional 10% discount as well on your subscription package. And as you can see there are various Neat PG Plus subscription modules again you can choose one depending on your needs and requirements. Now the upcoming date for the NEAT PG 2021 has been announced as 18th of April. So if you want to take a shorter duration crash course you can take a one month or three month duration, duration subscription package for the same and those of you who are targeting the next exams that is next year oncoming you can take the longer duration 12 month subscription package. It will give you ample time to go through all of the sessions. It will also leave you enough time in the end to revise as well well and as you can see it turns out to be more economical in the longer run and for those of you who are still in their third year of final year MBBS or you're simultaneously working as well you know hospital you know you have hospital duties to take care of you doing classes and clinics everything at the same time then you can take the 24 months duration subscription package it will allow you a slower pace of preparation and it turns out to be far more economical in the longer run and whatever platform or subscription package you choose if you use my code then you can avail a 10% discount on your subscription package as well while you are on the platform you can check out the various special classes that I have already conducted they are free for all anybody can join in and watch them uh, you can also check out the capsule courses but for that you will have to uh, subscribe to the plus platform you can use my referral code to avail a 10% discount on your subscription package now coming back to the session at hand for today so let's see who's joined in Kostab good evening Astha good evening Evna and Shweta good evening now Shweta you have a query from the previous session I believe that you're asking can neurons cross in seizure protoblast and can maternal blood cross through the placenta well maternal blood is definitely you know uh, going to get exchanged uh, I mean the nutrients and everything got, gets exchanged but some of the uh, the barrier the placental barrier is not a complete physical barrier so yes some fetal cells can enter into the maternal circulation in fact they do enter the 
maternal circulation, fetal cells. And fetal DNA also enters into the maternal circulation. And similarly, you know, maternal blood cells can also cross over to the fetus side, but that is something that is not often happening and that is something that is not excessively happening as well. So like I said that it's an incomplete barrier. So yes, some exchange of blood can also take place. Blood and blood cells can also take place across that barrier, right? Now, moving on, let's start the session and Shweta, I'll take your doubt in the end if that's okay with you. Now, let's get going and start talking about the placental hormones and we will take up uh, what are the important aspects that you need to remember and we'll take up, uh, you know, what are the clinical utility. So let's begin and let's ask a question to ourselves as to who oversees the pregnancy or as to who is the boss there in the pregnancy. Is it the fetus or is it the mother? I mean, if you look at it from a very bird's eye view, right, then you will always feel that, yes, it is the mother who's carrying the fetus, mother who's meeting the nutritional demands and oxygen demands of the fetus. But does that mean that fetus has no role or fetus is only passively there? lying inside the uterine cavity so who actually oversees the pregnancy who's the boss or who governs or who uh, you know is uh, ultimately responsible for maintaining the pregnancy so I have a different take on this I believe that it is the fetus which is you know uh, uh, you know bringing about changes in the mother's body helping her in the maternal adaptation to pregnancy because you see the fetus itself from early on in pregnancy right when it's an embryo you know it starts synthesizing products or hormones coming from the syncytiotrophoblast now the syncytiotrophoblast is again that same layer which gives rise to the chorion frondosum which gives rise to the placenta and it is the primary hormone producing uh, you know area of the placenta which is the syncytiotrophoblast so in another words yes of course it is the fetus itself which produces hormones by way of syncytiotrophoblast and it is these same very hormones which help the mother in physiological adaptation towards the pregnancy. So fetus plays an important role for its own self there right now moving on further let me prove this point to you as well so now you remember this diagram here i've been often showing it in my sessions right so you remember it from the chapter on implantation that we did that we have a fertilized uh, uh, you know zygote here and then the zygote forms the morula and then the morula forms the blastocyst and the blastocyst is implanting this is the blastocyst that is implanting now when the blastocyst is implanting in the uterine lining it it has already differentiated into an outer syncytiotrophoblast layer and an inner inner cell inner inner cell mass now it is this layer of syncytiotrophoblasts you see which starts synthesizing beta hcg from very early on in pregnancy as early as day 8 after fertilization so the beta HCG production from the syncytiotrophoblast cells begins as early as day 8 after fertilization and a very very important role that the, this beta HCG performs is what? Right now, what is the role of this beta HCG? A very, very important function that it does is you see here that when your egg is released during ovulation, it forms the corpus luteum, remember right corpus luteum remember produces progesterone which brings about secretory changes now i told you it is the same progesterone which brings about the decidualization of the endometrium and it you know this is the decidua which is an important component of placental development as well so decidual formation is very very important progesterone support to the pregnancy is very very important so how is it brought about i mean had there been no pregnancy the corpus luteum would have died by itself in another 10 to 12 days but now that there is an embryo implanting now that when there is an embryo which is synthesizing beta hcg beta hcg rescues this corpus luteum very very important a major major function of this beta hcg is to support the corpus luteum of 
pregnancy. So who's supporting the pregnancy? It is the fetus which is supporting the pregnancy for itself, you see. Otherwise, if there had been no beta HCG, had there been no fetus, had there been no embryo, there would have been no subsistence or persistence of this corpus luteum. So that's a very, very major function of beta HCG to maintain pregnancy in the early part, right? Now, later on, if you see here, what the corpus luteum secretes. So the question that they ask you in exams is, what does this corpus luteum secrete? So in addition to progesterone, does it secrete anything else? Yes, guys, in addition to progesterone, does it secrete anything else? Progesterone, it secretes like I told you. So Aisha has joined in, Dr. Chand and Peter are also there. Good evening to you guys. I just saw that you have joined in. So yes, guys, apart from progesterone, what else does the corpus luteum secrete? It also secretes estradiol. It also secretes a hormone which is called as relaxin. And it also secretes a hormone which is called as inhibin a right so more about the hormones in the subsequent session uh, today but let me just briefly tell you here that initially these very same hormones are coming by the corpus luteum later on the placenta is going to take over the production of progesterone estradiol relaxin and corpus luteum because the corpus luteum of pregnancy is going to have a lifespan of only about how many weeks Another MCQ, direct MCQ examination, corpus luteum of pregnancy is going to survive for how many weeks? Yes, guys, corpus luteum of pregnancy is going to survive only for about 10 weeks. That's the lifespan. After that, the placenta has already formed, right? By that time, the placenta is there and completely functional. So till that time that the placenta is not there, you see the corpus luteum produces these hormones. Now what is important here to remember another important point is that this progesterone, high levels of progesterone coming from the corpus luteum, high levels of estradiol coming from the corpus luteum, inhibin A coming from the corpus luteum, all of these hormones they lead to inhibition of the pituitary production of gonadotropins pituitary production of gonadotropins like LH and FSH hormones and that in turn leads to ovarian suppression right the ovarian follicles they are suppressed follicular growth is suppressed further ovulation is suppressed during the nine months of pregnancy and yes of course it is responsible for the amenorrhea of pregnancy so another important MCQ that they ask you in exams is why is there amenorrhea in pregnancy the reason there is amenorrhea in pregnancy is because the hormones that are coming from the corpus luteum of pregnancy in high amounts like progesterone, estradiol, inhibin A, they cause inhibition of the pituitary feedback, inhibition of the pituitary production of gonadotropins, therefore ovarian suppression and therefore amenorrhea in the nine months of pregnancy, right? more about these functions in subsequent sessions. Now, corpus luteum exclusively produces progesterone till seven weeks of gestation. That's a very, very important point to note. Why is it important to note? The implication is that if this corpus luteum is destroyed prior to seven weeks of gestation, maybe there is a surgery where you happen to, you know, remove the corpus luteum, uh, thinking that it's an ovarian cyst if you remove it if this corpus luteum is destroyed prior to seven weeks of pregnancy that is the only source of progesterone coming from uh, coming during pregnancy so if it's destroyed prior to seven weeks it can lead to spontaneous abortions that's an important clinical implication of this information now moving on further yes Aman it is given 10 to 12 weeks it is given 10 to 12 weeks as early as, but exclusively it is going, it's going to have a lifespan of about 10 to 12 weeks. Yes, the range is 10 to 12 weeks. So corpus luteum exclusively produces progesterone till seven weeks of gestation. And it is after 10 weeks, the placenta becomes the exclusive producer of progesterone, right? So after 10 weeks, the corpus luteum has started to die now, right? So that's why after 10 weeks, placenta is the 
exclusive source of progesterone in pregnancy. This is another important MCQ point that you need to remember. Now, between this 7 to 10 weeks, there is a luteal placental shift. That means that the corpus luteal production of progesterone is declining and the placental production of progesterone is increasing between 7 to 10 weeks right and another important mcq if they ask you in exam see they're very fond of asking ranges or sometimes they're very specifically asking you like for example if they ask you when does the progesterone production by the uh, clipopus luteum is taken over by the placenta as early as if they're saying as early as then your answer is eight weeks so placenta takes over progesterone production as early as eight weeks of gestation so prior to seven weeks of gestation till seven weeks corpus luteum is the only source of progesterone after 10 weeks placenta is the exclusive source of progesterone but if they ask you very specifically, placenta takes over progesterone production, it can take pro over progesterone production from corpus luteum as early as 8 weeks of gestation. Okay. Now, the other important aspect here is at term, what is the amount of placental product placental production of progesterone at term so once the progest placenta starts producing progesterone the amount of progesterone production increases throughout the nine months of pregnancy and the maximum production of progesterone is happening at term right and at term the placenta produces about 250 milligram per day of progesterone right so a lot of progesterone is coming from the placenta during pregnancy so these are important mcq points that you need to remember about corpus luteum and its production of progesterone now moving on further let's also talk about the steroid hormones in pregnancy right so steroid hormones in pregnancy are the estrogen and progesterone right now these steroid hormones in pregnancy coming from the placenta are coming from the syncytial trophoblast like i told you right now it's very important thing to note here is that that there is a fetus and there is a placenta right now the fetus and placenta by themselves independently they lack certain enzymes you know which are required for complete steroidogenesis so if you take up the steroid hormones right you have progesterone is a steroid hormone you have estrogen which is a steroid hormone and you also have the corticosteroids right the mineralocorticoids and the glucocorticoids these are also steroid hormones right so the fetus and the placenta by themselves they lack the certain enzymes which are required for complete steroidogenesis but together they can form a fetoplacental unit when acting together they are able to produce all right so therefore we have to appreciate this fetoplacental unit as well now moving on further the fetoplacental unit for its production of steroid hormones borrows the raw materials from the maternal compartment as well so when you talk about the placental production of steroid hormones right coming from the syncytial trophoblast you have to understand that some of the raw materials are provided by the maternal compartment also that means the mother also and some of the raw materials they come from the fetus and they all act together here forming in the placenta that is the feto placental maternal unit that we are going to talk about so let's go a little bit in detail and talk about this now this is the steroidogenesis chart I'm sure you must have done this in your second year MBBS. We often do this in our biochemistry chapters, right? This uh, steroid hormone production. So you see all steroid hormone productions begin from cholesterol, right? Now from cholesterol, we can get pregnenolone and it is acted upon by 17 alpha hydroxylase enzyme to produce DHEA, 
right and then it can form androgens that is uh, testosterone and androsteny die on by action of the enzyme 3 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase right it can also follow another path i mean for the production of progesterone pregnenolone has to be acted upon by 3 beta hydroxy dehydrogenase and that forms progesterone it is this progesterone which is used up to produce aldosterone progesterone is the raw material for aldosterone and hydroxy progesterone is the raw material for cortisol so these are your corticosteroids right now these corticosteroids are we know produced in which gland they are produced in the adrenal glands right now as far as we know that the adrenal glands also produce androgens right now androgens can get converted to estrogens by way of the enzyme aromatase so basically estrogen production will always require androgens as the raw material right now there is no estrogen production in the adrenal glands because adrenal glands don't contain this enzyme aromatase so one of the primary requirement for any tissue like the ovaries or like the placenta to produce estrogen has to be the presence of the enzyme aromatase in tissues where aromatase is present only in these tissues can androgens get aromatized to form estrogens right now what i want to say here is that your placenta lacks this enzyme 17 alpha hydroxylase placenta does not have this enzyme 17 hydroxylase so placenta by itself cannot produce androgen substrates which are required for the production of estrogen and your fetal adrenal glands and your fetal adrenal glands they lack this enzyme 3 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase so the fetal adrenal glands by themselves cannot use cholesterol to produce progesterone cannot use cholesterol to produce corticosteroids by themselves fetal adrenal glands cannot do that so the fetus and the placenta they depend on each other let's elaborate on this as well so let's elaborate on this as well let's talk about the fetal compartment when we say the adrenal glands that is the fetal adrenal glands the placental compartment and let's divide it into the maternal compartment three compartments right so for all steroid hormone production what is required cholesterol is required right so cholesterol in the placenta comes from the maternal compartment so ldl cholesterol from the maternal compartment or for the maternal blood stream it enters the placenta right and inside the placenta that ldl cholesterol can lead to production of progesterone because placenta has the enzyme 3 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 3 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase enzyme is present so progesterone can be formed by placenta directly by using the raw material from the maternal blood stream and it is this progesterone which will seep into back into the maternal circulation and it is this progesterone produced by the placenta which will also move into the fetal compartment and now the fetus itself is going to use this progesterone which it got from the placenta to produce its own corticosteroids because the fetal adrenal glands lack this enzyme 3 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase so they can't use ldl cholesterol to form progesterone and then corticosteroids so they can't do that so they are dependent on the progesterone coming from the placenta for their own synthesis of corticosteroids that is a very very important concept to remember right so let's get going and talk about the role of progesterone in pregnancy what does this progesterone do so we'll summarize the important functions of progesterone in pregnancy right the first and foremost is that it prepares the endometrium for implantation isn't it so each month 
When the egg is released, there's a corpus luteum which secretes progesterone and that progesterone each month is preparing the endometrium for implantation. Right. Secondly, as the progesterone production from the corpus luteum continues in the first seven weeks of pregnancy, it is also leading to the decidualization of the endometrium. That is also a role or function of progesterone. Right. Apart from that, what else is the role of this progesterone? Progesterone leads to angiotensin refractoriness in pregnancy. Now, what does this mean? What does this mean? You see in pregnancy, if you remember here that, you know, there's a lot of growth of the uterus, there's a growth of breasts and, you know, there's a lot of increase in blood volume in pregnancy and there is a lot of vasodilatation in pregnancy and pregnant women are often saying that they feel a lot of warmth and they feel as if heat is coming out of their hands and, you know, they feel that there's a low BP in pregnancy. So all of these changes are because of widespread vasodilatation which is taking place in pregnancy and it is brought about by the action of progesterone. Progesterone makes the blood vessels refractory to the vasoconstriction actions of angiotensin. So angiotensin uh, refractoriness in pregnancy is again a very very important step to maintain pregnancy and that is brought about by progesterone okay now other than that progesterone also promotes uterine quiescence during pregnancy now what is this uterine quiescence quiescence means quietness now you understand here that there is a uterus which is growing in size there is a fetus which is inside the uterus there is muscle stretching of the uterus there is muscle hypertrophy there is muscle hyperplasia so a lot of activity going there on the uterus but for nine months the uterus doesn't start contracting and getting uh, getting to deliver is it right so this uterine quietness or quiescence during pregnancy is maintained because of high levels of progesterone in pregnancy that's another important role of progesterone right and progesterone also leads to suppression of the maternal immune response to fetal antigen so in my chapter on placenta is i'd raised this question that why isn't the fetus rejected by the mother now, one of the possible reasons is also because of high levels of progesterone which suppresses the maternal immune response to fetal antigen so these are the important functions of progesterone in pregnancy right now aman you are saying does progesterone prevent prostaglandin release now not directly so but what prostaglandin what progesterone does is it stabilizes the lysosomal membranes you see inside the cell okay there are lysosomes right and it is these lysosomes which contains enzymes and you know proteases which are can be released and then they are going to trigger the inflammatory response then it is these uh, inflammatory mediators which are going to trigger the release of, of prostaglandins so yes by that logic yes progesterone what it does it it stabilizes the lysosomal membranes and it inhibits the release of it inhibits the release of matrix metalloproteinases and it also you know suppresses the production of prostaglandins as well so yes that's partly correct so that is how it is promoting uterine quiescence in pregnancy okay now moving on further another very very important role of progesterone in pregnancy is that it is a direct substrate for the fetal adrenal gland production of corticosteroids like I explained to you fetuses adrenal glands they cannot produce corticosteroids without borrowing progesterone from the placenta so it is that progesterone coming from the placenta which is a substrate for fetal adrenal gland production of corticosteroids right now moving on further let's talk about the production of 
estrogen. Now, as far as the production of estrogen goes, you have to understand, now the fetus has what the placenta lacks. That is the androgen precursors for estrogen production, right? So, on the inset here, I have, uh, you know, kept the chart handy so that we can refer to it if we need, right? So, in the fetal compartment, that is in the fetal adrenal glands, the LDL cholesterol by utilizing 17 alpha hydroxylase enzyme, because that is present in the fetal adrenal glands. It can produce DHEAS. So Costa was rightly saying that the exact DHEA, the DHEA that is produced by the fetal adrenal glands, dehydroepiandrosteridione, is the sulfated form of DHEA. So that is dehydroepiandrosteridione sulfate right so this dheas further enters the placental compartment because if you see here from dehydroepiandrosteridione to the production of androgens like androstenedione and testosterone what is required 3 beta hydroxy uh, steroid uh, dehydrogenase enzyme is required now that enzyme is absent in the fetal adrenal glands right so further utilization of dheas in the fetal adrenal gland doesn't happen so all the dheas is diverted towards the placenta now the placenta can use this dheas to form androgens because placenta has 3 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase that is present in the placental compartment. So now the DHEAS is going to be utilized to produce more stronger androgens like androstenedione and testosterone. And the placenta also has got aromatase activity, right? So those androgens are now going to be aromatized to form estrogens, okay? Now, estrogens which are released from the placenta, they are going to then enter into the maternal compartment and they are then going to bring about the maternal adaptation to pregnancy and the role of estrogen I am going to describe in another moment. Now, what I also want you to hear is to appreciate that some of this DHEAS, okay, in the fetal liver, some of this DHEAS in the fetal liver becomes hydroxylated, becomes hydroxylated, a hydroxylated form of DHEAS forms. Now, this hydroxylated form of DHEAS, when enters the placental compartment, will undergo the same reactions, will change to hydroxylated androgens, right and these hydroxylated androgens when they will aromatize they will form a specific type of estrogen can you tell me which specific type of estrogen am i talking about which specific type of uh, which specific type of estrogen am i talking about very good dr kostub estriol estriol and that is why you see estriol is that form of estrogen E3 which is encountered or found only in a pregnant woman. It comes only from the placenta because the substrate that is responsible for the production of estriol can only come when the fetal adrenal glands, those produce DHEs and it gets hydroxylated in the fetal liver. That is why estriol is the form of estrogen which is specific to pregnancy only. Right, so Peter Khan and Kostob answer that very, very correctly. Now, before moving on further, Kostob, I just saw your doubt here. Is it in case of large placenta, premature uterine contractions happen? Now, premature uterine contractions they can happen for many reasons. Right, one of the reasons in a not because of a large placenta particularly, but mainly because of uterine over distension. 
right? What what can happen is that yes, sometimes what can happen is that if one has to say premature uterine contractions or what is the etiology of preterm labor, if that is what you're trying to say, then that is when the estrogen is raised more in relation to progesterone. You see, progesterone is maintaining the uterine quietness right but if the estrogen production is increased more then that triggers uterine contractions okay the balance between estrogen and progesterone when that shifts when that tilts when there is more estrogen relative to progesterone that is when the uterine contractions are triggered not particularly because of a large placenta okay now Let's move on further and let's look up at this MCQ. I mean, these are the kind of MCQs they will ask you from this topic then. I mean, if they ask you, what's the principal androgen which is used for placental estrogen synthesis, then what's your answer? If they ask you, what's the principal androgen used for placental estrogen synthesis, then what's your answer? Yes, it is DHEAS. Right, it is the principal androgen used for placental estrogen synthesis and it comes from the fetal adrenal glands. Okay. Now, moving on further, let's have a look at this question. All of the following statements are true about placental steroid hormone production except. So what is the false statement? Yes, guys, what is the false statement? The precursor for progesterone is mainly derived from LDL cholesterol of the mother. That's a true statement. That's a true statement. The major precursor to placental estrogen production is fetal adrenal gland androgens. Yes, that is also true. Estriol production is exclusive to the placenta. That's also true. But option number B, corpus luteum also produces estriol? No. I mean, corpus luteal produces estrogens, yes. But estradiol, estrone, the E1 and E2 forms of estrogen, not estriol. Estriol comes only from the placenta because the substrate can come only from the fetus. So this statement here is false, right? So corpus luteum also produces estriol is the false statement there. So Costa, Mukheni and Peter got that very correct. All right. Now, moving on further, what are the various estrogens in pregnancy which come from the placenta? So, placenta is able to produce all types of estrogen. Estradiol, which we say E2, it is the most predominant form of estrogen in reproductive age group women, right? Now, apart from that, it also produces estrone. It also produces estriol. And it also produces another minor, another hydroxylated form of uh, estrogen, which is E4, that is e okay? So both of these are specific to pregnancy only and specifically coming from the placenta only. Now, if in your exams, they ask you this question, which is the estrogen which is produced in the greatest amount from the placenta? Maximum amount of production per day. Then what's your answer? The estrogen produced in the greatest amount is actually estriol. Okay. And estriol will be able to be detected in the maternal serum when? When can you detect estriol in the maternal serum? Can you detect it at 6 weeks? Can you detect it at 7 weeks? Can you find estriol in the maternal bloodstream early on in pregnancy? No. You will be able to find estriol in the maternal bloodstream as and when the fetal adrenal glands will become functional. Right? So the estriol is found in the maternal serum. It is first detectable in the maternal serum at about nine weeks of gestation. First detected in maternal serum at about nine weeks of gestation. That is when the fetal adrenal glands start their 
activity they start becoming functional right but yes if they ask you what is the estrogen in maximum concentration in the maternal serum right then your answer is estradiol so at any point in time in pregnancy right after the estradiol starts getting released the estrogen that is found in maximum concentration in the maternal serum is estradiol now why the discrepancy the discrepancy is because whatever estradiol is produced by whatever estradiol is produced by the placenta and thrown into the maternal circulation is very rapidly metabolized and eliminated from the body so estradiol has got a very rapid metabolization very rapidly metabolized and eliminated from the body as compared to estradiol so when you measure the concentration in the maternal serum it is estradiol which is found in maximum concentration followed by estradiol and lastly followed by estrone so that's the difference so though estrogen produced in greatest amount is estradiol but the one that is found in maximum concentration in the maternal serum at any point in time is estradiol because whatever estradiol is produced is rapidly metabolized and eliminated by the maternal bloodstream by the maternal system okay now moving on further what's the role of estrogen in pregnancy now estrogen is directly responsible for promoting hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the uterine myometrium that's a direct role of estrogen from early on in pregnancy estrogen is also responsible for development and hypertrophy of the breasts together with progesterone so both the hormones contribute to development of hypertrophy of the breasts uh, in pregnancy so the development of the breast ducts is brought about by estrogen and for the development of breast alveoli estrogen plus progesterone both are required right so two direct effects of estrogen in pregnancy are these thirdly estrogen also sensitizes the myometrium to oxytocin and prostaglandins right so in the prior session i told you that the progesterone is responsible for maintaining the uterine cohesions now during term during term you know as and when the pregnancy reaches term you see what happens is that there is a biological clock with the fetus the fetus starts releasing more adrenal gland androgens and therefore more estrogens coming from the placenta therefore the ratio of estrogen to progesterone which throughout pregnancy had been more in favor of progesterone there was more progesterone throughout pregnancy but near to term there's a biological clock which gets started and the fetus starts secreting more of androgen substrates from the adrenal gland therefore more of estrogen coming from the placenta therefore the balance is in favor of estrogen now now this is if this estrogen which sensitizes the myometrium to oxytocin and prostaglandins right and cause the yes estrogen is responsible for ectropion uh yes true estrogen is going to cause hyperplasia and hypertrophy of the endocervical epithelium as well and then it is going to pout out on the uh, uh, ectocervix and then that is called as ectropion right that's why ectropion is often seen uh, you know in women who have uh, more uh, who consume oral contraceptive pills as well because of the estrogenic effect on the endocervical epithelium as well so these are the three important roles of estrogen pregnancy along with that along with progesterone estrogen and progesterone together they bring about all the changes which are required in maternal adaptation to pregnancy this is a separate topic which i am going to tape up tomorrow 
maternal adaptation to pregnancy is a separate topic which I'm going to take up tomorrow to elaborate it in detail. Now, let's talk about the various protein hormones in pregnancy. Now, the protein hormones in pregnancy, which are most important for you guys to remember, is first of all that they are produced by the syncytial trophoblast as well. Okay, so that's another question they ask. This hormone is synthesized from what part? So, protein hormones are also coming from syncytial trophoblast. Now, the two hormones that we are going to talk about is human chorionic gonadotropin, that is HCG, and human placental lactogen that is also called as human chorionic somatomammotropin. Now, the basic biochemical differences between these two hormones that you need to remember is that human chorionic gonadotropin is a glycoprotein. Okay, it's a glycoprotein hormone. It's a protein hormone, but it is glycosylated and it has two subunits, alpha and beta subunits. We know of this already. We've discussed it at various points in our sessions, right? Now, the alpha subunit is the similar subunit. It is common subunit, which is shared between other hormones like TSH, like LH, like FSH also. And your beta subunit is the specific subunit. So beta subunit of TSH, LH, FSH and HCG are going to be different. And the alpha subunit is going to be shared. It is going to be similar for these hormones. Right. Now, since it is glycosylated, when it needs to be metabolized by the body, you see, if a body has to break down the glycoprotein, it will first remove the glycogen. It will first remove the glucose moieties, then it will break down the individual peptide bonds. So since it is a glycoprotein and it is glycosylated to a very large extent, it has a very large half-life. It has a very long half-life of about 24 hours. So these are, this is also an important MCQ that is asked of you guys. What is the half-life of human chorionic gonadotropin? Now this half-life of 24 hours is that of human chorionic gonadotropin, which is coming from the placenta. The placenta produces human, uh, human chorionic gonadotropin, which is highly glycosylated. Okay. On the other hand, the human placental lactogen is a polypeptide. It's a polypeptide hormone. So therefore, it is metabolized much faster. And therefore, the half-life of human placental lactogen is only about 15 minutes. Okay. And Dr. Kostov, what's your doubt here? What's your question here? Sharing of alpha subunits is the reason for thyrotoxicosis in molar pregnancy? Yes. Yes. So your beta HCG can act like a thyrotropic hormone, can act like TSH hormone on the thyroid gland and promote excessive thyroid hormone production. Therefore, thyrotoxicosis when occurs in molar pregnancy is because of this reason. Very well. Very well. Rightly pointed out cost of them. Okay. So once we have done just done this, this is more of a, you know theoretical about the differences between HCG and polypepta uh, and human placental lactogen. What is far more important to remember is the role of HCG in pregnancy. Now, one of the role of HCG in pregnancy is already established: rescue and maintenance of corpus luteum. That is the most important. And that is the one role that is definitely proven also. That is the only role that is 100% definitely proven role of HCG in pregnancy is rescue and maintenance of corpus luteum. After that, the HCG can also act like LH, can also act like the LH hormone and therefore, it can lead to stimulation of fetal testes to secrete testosterone. So, it is the fetal testes in a male fetus, of course. In a male fetus, of course, a male fetus has testes. Those testes need to produce testosterone. That will lead to the differentiation of the male genitalia. Differentiation of the male genitalia right 
and therefore this secretion of testosterone and this stimulation of fetal testes is not happening early on because of LH coming from the fetal pituitary no fetal pituitary is able to secrete LH after third month after third month you know of pregnancy of sorry, after third month of gestation but your differentiation of male genitalia is happening much before that it is happening at around uh, 10 to 14 weeks of gestation so who is promoting the fetal testes to secrete testosterone it is hcg which act like the lh hormone and it stimulates fetal testes to secrete testosterone therefore helpful in a male fetus to differentiate into a male external and internal genitalia that is another role of hcg in pregnancy what else should you remember? HCG leads to stimulation of maternal thyroid gland. So like Ostrup said that when HCG is excessive like in molar pregnancy, it can lead to thyrotoxicosis, right? But even then, you know, in normal pregnancy also, maternal thyroid hormone production increases. I will talk about more about it when I talk about the maternal adaptation to pregnancy. But one thing you that you should remember is that maternal thyroid hormone production is increased in pregnancy and the stimulus for that comes from HCG that is coming from the placenta. So stimulation of maternal thyroid gland during pregnancy and increased thyroid hormone production. So yes okay now Aisha when you write that raised TSH should cause hypothyroidism then that statement is not true right what is the reverse statement is true Aisha hypothyroidism when it is a primary hypothyroidism leads to raised TSH okay the reverse is true right when your thyroid gland is not producing hormones problem is with the thyroid gland okay then low hormones right then the low hormone levels give a sensor to the brain that the hormones are low so the brain releases the pituitary releases more of tsh to counteract that hormone deficiency so raised tsh does not cause hypothyroidism but hypothyroidism when primary hypothyroidism is there it leads to raised tsh levels aisha the reverse is true okay all right now, this was the third role of HCG in pregnancy, stimulation of maternal thyroid gland. The other role, other potential role for HCG in pregnancy is that it assists, it assists estrogen and progesterone hormones in maintaining vascular vasodilatation during pregnancy and also helping progesterone in maintaining uterine smooth muscle relaxation. So that is an additional role but your three main roles are the top three roles and the fourth is yes it supports other hormones in their functions as well. Now moving on further the next question that they ask you in exam, when can HCG, HCG be detected in the maternal serum earliest? When can HCG be first detected in the maternal serum? I told you when it is first starts getting synthesized. As early as day 8 after fertilization? Around the same time, around the same time, around the time of the blastocyst implantation, around the same time that it starts getting secreted, it starts getting detected in maternal serum as well. That's the same. So you don't have to remember two, num two, two values for that. So the answer here is eight days after fertilization as early as eight days after fertilization now if ovulation took place on the 14th day right and therefore fertilization also took place on the 14th day right so sometimes in your mcqs in your exams they will say day 22 of cycle yes eight days after fertilization is the same as day 22 of the cycle it is the same as five days prior to missed period 
it is the same as five day prior to the expected but missed period as well right in a woman who has regular 28 day cycles your beta hcg can be detected in the maternal serum day 22 of cycle five days prior to the expected but missed period as well this is the answer whatever they might ask you if they have these options you can choose them correctly okay now uh, Raj, I'll just take up a question before moving on further. Rajesh was saying that is it necessary to give injection beta HCG in early pregnancy? No. No, it is not necessary to give in all pregnancies. Even in a case of, even in the case of, uh, let's say you're talking about, uh, you must have seen people giving it for threatened abortions, you see, or for missed abortions or for whatever reason. But if the fetus is itself not properly formed, right, the most common cause of abortions is chromosomal abnormalities in the fetus itself. Then the syncytial trophoblast is also for not forming. Therefore, the HCG production is also not there right so it has not been documented that giving hcg is going to help in those situations because the fetus might itself be the problem right so yes people do give injection hcg for spontaneous abortions or for threatened abortions but that is not supported by any documented evidence or research or anything all right but yes when you do an ivf pregnancy in ivf cycles yes we tend to give injection beta hcg there okay five days prior to missed period missed period 28 day you hold the nose like this or you hold the nose like this it you still hold the nose only so day 22 of the cycle is five days prior to the expected period that's what i'm trying to say here so if the expected period was supposed to come uh, on the 28th day or the 29th day 28th day, then five days prior to the expected or missed period so cost of you are saying serum estimation is better than urine see the difference is that serum estimation by serum estimation you will be able to diagnose uh, pregnancy much sooner it's not the question about of about being better or not better okay so the only difference here is that if you want to diagnose a pregnancy prior to the expected missed period then you will have to use hcg to diagnose it all right serum testing okay and the question here is that if you want to detect HCG in the serum, you will have to use different kinds of tests. You will have to use tests which can detect HCG at lower levels also. Right? I'll come to that in a bit. Okay? I'll come to that in a bit as well. So, we'll answer Kostub's question also whether serum estimation is better than urine. But for that, let us check the trends of HCG in maternal serum. Let us check the trends of HCG in maternal serum. So when it starts getting detected in the maternal serum, this is the maternal serum on the y-axis here, HCG values in the maternal serum. And as and when, you know, it starts getting detected, that is very early on, from eight days after fertilization, it starts increasing exponentially and it reaches a maximum level of about 100,000 international units per liter at around 8 to 10 weeks of gestation. So that's another MCQ that they ask you in exams. At what gestation does HCG is, is maximum in the maternal serum? It is at 8 to 10 weeks of gestation. Once it peaks, after that it declines and it reaches a nadir. That means a lowest point at around 16 weeks of gestation. And after that, it stays at that level of throughout pregnancy and it comes back to normal after two weeks of delivery, after two weeks of delivery. Okay, so these are the trends of HCG in the maternal serum. Okay, so if you want to use a test to detect HCG in the urine, right hcg starts to come in the urine about the time of missed menses okay that is around the time of four weeks here so the levels have to be somewhere around at the time of about expected menses at the time of about expected menses all right then 
At that time, the levels of HCG in the serum are about 100 international units per litre. Now, when the levels are around this 100 international per units per litre, they start to come in the urine as well. So, then you can use a urine pregnancy test. But if you have to use uh, the, uh, to die, you, you have to use tests to diagnose uh, a pregnancy before the expected menses, then you will have to check for the serum HCG and then you will have to use ELISA based test, you might need to use radio immunoassay based test or fluorescence immunoassay based test which have greater sensitivity of diagnosing or picking up HCG in the serum. That means these tests will be able to detect HCG even when the levels are much much lower than 100 international units per litre. Right. So the difference is not about which being better or not, but difference is in sensitivity of the various tests that are used. OK, clear. So cost. So now another important point that I want to make here is after you see these trends of HCG in the maternal serum, another important point that I want to make here is this area look at this area in the early weeks of pregnancy till the time it is maximum the levels of hcg in the maternal serum are rising exponentially actually they are doubling aren't they can you see the levels of hcg are doubling in the maternal serum the question that i need to ask you is what is the doubling time of hcg in the maternal serum what is the doubling time of HCG in the maternal serum? What is the doubling time of HCG in the maternal serum, guys? About two days. About two days. So every two days, every 48 hours, the HCG value doubles. Yes, Kostav rightly said 1.4 to 2 days is the range. If you have to pick one option, pick two days. If you have to pick one option, pick two days, that is 48 hours. And Peter, your question, UPT is based on which principle? It's based on the principle of ELISA, sandwich ELISA. Okay, so Kostub answered that there. So yes, now coming back to this doubling pattern. So this doubling can only be seen in a healthy intrauterine pregnancy, right? The doubling will only be seen if it's a healthy intrauterine pregnancy. Otherwise, the doubling values of HCG in the maternal serum will not be seen, right? Now, moving on further, what is responsible? I just remember, what is responsible for nausea and vomiting in pregnancy? What is responsible for nausea and vomiting in pregnancy? Yes, what is responsible for nausea and vomiting in pregnancy? HCG again. Same HCG again responsible for nausea, vomiting in pregnancy. Actually, HCG, you know, kind of stimulates the chemoreceptor, uh, you know, trigger zone in the brain and therefore it, uh, you know, sensitizes the woman to the effects of, uh, you know, nausea and vomiting as well. The important point to know about these trends, from these trends you can decipher. If I ask you, when is the nausea, vomiting peaking in pregnancy? Then what's your answer? And when does the nausea vomiting settle down in pregnancy? Yes. When is it peaking? The nausea vomiting in peak in pregnancy is going to peak at around the same time that HCG is peaking. So it peaks at around 8 to 10 weeks of gestation. And for most women, nausea vomiting settles down by 16 weeks. Right. So they ask you this question also in the exams. When is nausea vomiting peaking in pregnancy in women which are around 8 to 10 weeks and it settles down by 16 weeks of pregnancy as and when the beta HCG levels also settle down. And Aisha rightly saying whenever there is going to be excessive HCG more than required then it is going to lead to hyperemesis excessive nausea vomiting like in molar pregnancy so like aisha is saying in molar pregnancy there is often excessive nausea vomiting and hyperemesis can be there as well 
So let's have a look at certain MCQs. Let's have a look at certain MCQs. Which of the following statements about HCG is true? Which is the true statement, guys, here? Which is the true statement? It causes involution of the corpus luteum. That's entirely false. It supports the corpus luteum. It doesn't cause involution of the corpus luteum. It doubles in every 7 to 10 days. False. It doubles every 48 hours in early pregnancy as long as it's a healthy pregnancy. Maximum levels in maternal serum are seen at term. That's also false. Maximum levels in maternal serums are not seen at term but at 8 to 10 weeks. And yes, this is the true statement. It has the highest carbohydrate content among all glycosylated hormones in humans. Among all, it has the highest carbohydrate content among all glycosylated hormones. So C is the only true statement here. Let's have a look at the next question. High levels of HCG in maternal serum are found in all except. So high levels of maternal HCG. Molar pregnancy, yes, because there is extensive proliferation of chorionic villi in molar pregnancy, chorionic villi, syncytial trophoblast, more HCG, right? Twins, larger placenta, two placentas, two fetuses contributing to more HCG. So twins also high levels of HCG, right? Down syndrome fetuses, they have also been seen to have higher HCG levels in the maternal serum, but ectopic pregnancy pregnancy which is not healthy intrauterine pregnancy right at another location ectopic now that's not a normal location if pregnancy is not in the normal location then normal proliferation of chorionic villi also does not take place so ectopic pregnancies are associated with lower levels as compared to normal healthy intrauterine pregnancies Moreover, ectopic pregnancy will show a plateauing of HCG. Instead of rising HCG levels in early pregnancy, there will be plateauing of HCG. It will not rise, it will not double every 48 hours. And lower levels of HCG will also be seen in aborting pregnancies. In aborting pregnancies also, lower levels will be seen. So, in aborting pregnancies, there will be a dramatic fall of HCG levels, isn't it? Because the pregnancy are failing. If they are failing, that means the fetus is dying. That means syncytiotrophoblast is no longer producing progesterone, sorry, is HCGs. So, sharp decline in aborting pregnancies in the HCG levels. And Kostov rightly said, if you have estimated the gestational age wrongly, that will also lead to, uh, in uh, you know, um, uh, this thing, what do we call it? If you have overestimated or underestimated a gestational age, then that will lead to misrepresentation of the HCG levels. So that will also be there. Now, let's have a look at the next question. A urine pregnancy test has a sensitivity for detection of HCG at 25 MIU per ml in the serum. It will come positive as early as, when does the urine pregnancy test come positive? As early as, yes guys, when does the urine pregnancy test come positive? Plain and simple Women, they tend to think they are pregnant when they have an expected missed period. I mean, you know, they were expecting a period, but they didn't come. So it's a missed period. That is when they think that they could be pregnant. That is when they go to the store and buy a urine pregnancy kit and do a home-based urine pregnancy test. So urine pregnancy test can come positive as early as day of expected missed menses. Okay. Eight days after fertilization, if you have to check for um, HCG, then you cannot do it in the urine. Then you will have to do it in the serum based uh, test. Whether you use ELISA based test or radio immunoassay based test, that would be different. Okay. Now, moving on further, what's the clinical utility of HCG? First, clinical utility, diagnosis of pregnancy. 
way like we just discussed monitoring pregnancy of unknown location isn't it have you read this topic pregnancy of unknown location a woman who has amenorrhea a woman who has a positive pregnancy test a woman who has a positive pregnancy test add a woman in which on ultrasound you can't localize whether where is the pregnancy that becomes a pregnancy of unknown location so if the beta hcg levels in the serum if the beta hcg levels in the serum are doubling every 48 hours doubling every 48 hours then we are thinking that it is likely an intrauterine pregnancy a healthy intrauterine pregnancy like i told you if the beta hcg levels are not doubling every 48 hours in early pregnancy but they are plateauing they are not doubling but plateauing every 48 hours then it is likely an ectopic pregnancy and if the beta hcg levels are drastically falling drastically falling that's about you know falling more than 50% of the value then it is likely a failing intrauterine pregnancy failing intrauterine pregnancy so the clinical utility of hcg measurement serum hcg measurement is in evaluating cases where we end up having a pregnancy of unknown location a woman with amenorrhea with a pregnancy test positive but ultrasound showing nothing you are don't know where the sac is you're not able to see where is the location of the pregnancy okay now plateauing of uh, uh, dr costa plateauing is plus minus 10% plus minus 10% from the previous hcg value that is plateauing okay now moving on the other clinical utility is follow up after molar pregnancy evacuation right molar pregnancy beta hcg is excessively raised right excessively raised after we have done molar pregnancy evacuation we follow up the pregnancy with beta hcg to ensure that no gestational trophoblastic neoplasia develop so that's another important clinical utility of hcg and it is also a part of biochemical screening for down syndrome affected fetus isn't it so hcg i told you is going to be elevated in a down syndrome affected fetus so it's a part of biochemical screening for down syndrome affected fetus as well it's a marker for gestational trophoblastic neoplasia and outside of pregnancy it is also a marker for choriocarcinoma of the ovary this is in the outside of pregnancy right so it is also seen raised in choriocarcinoma of the uh, ovary so this is just to complete the list i have formulated this uh, four five findings here but yes as far as pregnancy is concerned the utility is here as far as outside of pregnancy is concerned it's a marker for gestational trophoblastic neoplasia as well as raised in choriocarcinoma of the ovary now moving on further let's talk about human placental lactogen okay now human placental lactogen i told you it's a polypeptide hormone half life of only 15 minutes so it's a single chain polypeptide hormone it's structurally similar to growth hormone as well as to prolactin however however although being structurally similar to growth hormone prolactin the role is not not that as of growth hormone or prolactin the function is entirely different okay so it is first detected in the maternal serum after about 3 weeks of fertilization and they steadily rise throughout pregnancy once they start getting detected in the maternal serum the levels rise throughout pregnancy and their levels in the maternal serum reflect the placental mass so levels in the maternal serum this is important to remember levels in the maternal serum reflect the placental mass so a placenta that is developing well a placenta that is functioning well will have increasing levels of human placental lactogen throughout 
pregnancy right so basically in short it signifies placental well being if the placenta is functioning well human placental lactogen production should steadily rise throughout pregnancy reaching a production rate at term to about 1 gram per day you know why this is important 1 gram per day because this is the highest per day rate of production of any hormone in the body at any point in time inside pregnancy outside pregnancy anywhere this is the highest rate of production of hormone achieved in the human body production rate at term is about 1 gram of human placental lactogen being produced per day so all of these are important one line pointers that you should remember for your exam more important conceptual understanding is here let's have a look at this question If I were to ask you, human placental lactogen hormone secretion is proportional to the placental mass, and it signifies placental well-being. And the role of this hormone in pregnancy is what is the one most important role of this hormone in pregnancy? Stimulate milk production. Well, that's the role of prolactin mostly. fetal breast development growth of fetus so though it resembles growth hormone though it resembles prolactin in structure it does not lead to these functions in pregnancy the major important function is what is it what is it it is maternal endocrine regulation maternal endocrine regulation a better term actually in this question since i've taken it from a previous paper a better term would be maternal metabolic regulation i would prefer a better term as maternal metabolic regulation rather than endocrine regulation so like peter is saying it promotes insulin resistance very well the role of human placental lactogen is to maintain insulin resistance in pregnancy very very important why is it required it is very essential in pregnancy that insulin resistance occurs and it keeps on increasing in pregnancy why is that why is that because the fetus needs glucose all the time mother's blood is the only source of fetus for the baby of uh, only source of glucose for the baby so whenever there is insulin resistance in pregnancy you see a mother is going to eat a meal glucose is going to get absorbed glucose in blood stream right but that glucose in blood stream will not be adequately utilized by the maternal body cells because insulin promotes moving of glucose from the blood stream to the cells insulin what does it do it leads to glucose going from the blood stream to the cells for usage right so when there is insulin resistance the glucose in the blood stream will not be able to go to the cells entirely because there is some degree of insulin resistance isn't it so that is going to lead to maternal postprandial hyperglycemia right so because of maternal postprandial hyperglycemia or excessive glucose there the glucose is going to get diverted towards the fetus agar mother is going to use all the glucose and going to use all the glucose and put it in her cells how it, how is it going to reach the baby right so maintaining insulin resistance in pregnancy is very very important right so glucose is diverted to the fetus and overnight you see overnight when the mother is sleeping at that time she is not eating but even at that time the glu uh, the baby is extracting the glucose from the maternal blood stream so there is fasting hypoglycemia fasting hypoglycemia in pregnancy is also normal phenomena it's not hypoglycemia to the extent that the mother is going to collapse but yes there is certain degree of fasting hypoglycemia as compared to her normal fasting glucose levels outside of pregnancy right so fasting hypoglycemia occurs because overnight also the fetus has been using uh, you know the mother has been transporting glucose to the fetus side as well so that's your answer why does gdm does not occur in all females because even though there is insulin resistance in pregnancy it is balanced you see all this is in comparison to what the non pregnant state was like 
okay if there is insulin resistance in pregnancy it is in comparison to what her prior status was like so even though these changes are operating overall overall you glycemia normal glucose levels in the range are maintained but now if you think of a woman who is already insulin resistance or who is already genetically predisposed to insulin resistance she could be pcos she could be having a family history of diabetes right so if she is genetically predisposed predispositioned to insulin resistance she could be pcos or she could be having a high risk family history then she is more likely to develop gdm in pregnancy that's why they say pregnancy is a diabetogenic state it is a diabetogenic state true but not all women will develop gdm right okay now another thing that this insulin resistance does to counteract this insulin resistance you think that the pancreas are going to sit quietly no to counteract this insulin resistance in pregnancy there is hyperinsulinemia right and this hyperinsulinemia helps in building fat stores okay excess insulin production now excess insulin production insulin laid down lipid stores fat stores are laid down by the mother and these fat stores are laid down specially in the first half of pregnancy most of these fat stores are laid down in the first half of pregnancy now what happens in the second half what happens in the second half is as pregnancy advances the human placental lactogen levels increase even further when that happens hpl has a role in stimulating maternal lipolysis very very important concept i'm driving at stimulate maternal lipolysis and that leads to increase in fe fatty acids because as pregnancy advances you see the glucose requirement of the fetus is further going to increase because the fetus is also growing isn't it so the mother needs to push through more and more glucose towards the fetus side so if the mother is going to push all that glucose that she consumes towards the fetus side what is she going to use for her own energy requirements she uses free fatty acids for her own energy requirements not absolute okay nothing is absolute i mean of course she uses glucose as well but she can now use free fatty acids for her own energy requirements as well and therefore further diverting the glucose towards the fetus what is the clinical implication of this the clinical implication of this now understand if there is a woman who has hyperemesis if there is a woman who has hyperemesis okay she is vomiting whatever she is eating she is vomiting up she is not able to get glucose at all or if a woman goes on a prolonged fast okay she is prolonged fasting right what will happen what will happen what will happen if there is hyperemesis in pregnancy or if there is a prolonged fasting okay now you and i might able to tolerate a lot of vomiting you and i might able to tolerate a lot of prolonged fasting as well but not pregnant women you see because then what will happen is that she will use more and more free fatty acids free fatty acids more free free fatty acids are going to be used more and more more and more ketones are going to be released more and more ketones are going to be released now that's a problem you see ketosis in pregnancy is a problem because free fatty acids don't cross the placenta but these ketone bodies they can cross the placenta and they can harm the fetus okay therefore it is not advisable for pregnant women to go on prolonged fasting right therefore any degree of diarrhea or hyperemesis where the woman might go into ketosis those conditions need to be treated urgently you see because then there can be harm to the fetus because of ketosis which develops in pregnant women much faster as compared to non pregnant women in the same circumstances okay so that's the clinical implication of understanding what human placental lactogen does or how it helps in pregnancy adaptation and what are its clinical 
implications okay now moving on further let's have a look at this question which of the following hormones in the maternal serum decreases after the first trimester of pregnancy this is a plain and simple forward one liner mcq which of the following hormones decreases in the first trimester of pregnancy after the first trimester of pregnancy sorry so progesterone levels keep rising throughout pregnancy hcg human placenta lactogen keep rising throughout pregnancy so does estrogen so does prolactin levels but not hcg hcg levels they decrease after the first trimester of pregnancy right there so that's your answer now let's have a look at this one question now uh, i told you that i'll talk about relaxin hormone um, subsequently so let's talk about relaxin hormone now this relaxin hormone comes from the corpus luteum also it comes from the decidu also it comes from the placenta also it contributes to all of the following in pregnancy except basically this is as much as i want you guys to remember about relaxin for your pg entrance examination so relaxin hormone has been known to contribute to all of the following except now people always tend to ascertain relaxin meaning it is relaxing the joints it is not relaxing the joints it is not responsible for peripheral joint laxity it does lead to remodeling of the reproductive tract that means collagen changes in the reproductive tract isn't it see 9 months of pregnancy after that delivery so there has to be some uh, reproductive tract changes in the vagina in the cervix you see the connective tissue breakdown and everything so that remodeling and softening of the reproductive tract connective tissue that is operated by relaxin it helps again estrogen progesterone along with that helps promotes vasodilatation also and it helps in increasing renal blood actually renal artery vasodilatation so increase in gfr by increasing renal blood flow as well so blood flow as well so these are the possible roles of relaxin but do not say relax in meaning relax the peripheral joint no it has no role in maintaining the peripheral joint laxity so now uttam you are asking what is the best treatment for condition in hyperemesis if there is hyperemesis to the extent see first of all if it's because of a molar pregnancy then you evacuate the molar pregnancy and the level subside and then the patient is normal but if in the course of normal pregnancy a woman is having hyperemesis right then the management is about uh, you know dealing with the ketosis so one has to admit the woman if she is not able to tolerate orally right jo bhi khati hai she vomits out then she needs to be admitted iv fluid support need to be given so that you know uh, she uh, your ketosis is treated you need to give iv fluids right you need to give uh, Uh, dextrose from outside but and uh, after that you will also need to give her some anti emetic medication so you need to stabilize her for a day or two and slowly slowly introduce solid feeds so that is what is done in the management of hyperemesis gravidarum right i can put i'll be be talking about hyperemesis in more about in subsequent sessions when we'll deal with pregnancy complications as well so moving on further let's have a look at this mcq what is the prolactin uh, prolactin is also found in the amniotic fluid okay prolactin in the amniotic fluid is derived from where now actually just give let me give you a brief overview of this why this question even arises you see uh, some of the estro- some of the hormone like hcg some of the hormone like you know uh, maternal serum uh, so alpha fetoprotein that is produced by the fetus right all of these hormones that are produced from the placenta also uh, some of them go towards the maternal circulation some of them go towards the amniotic fluid also so little amounts of hormones that are produced by the placenta they are also found in the amniotic fluid but specifically if they ask you prolactin in the amniotic fluid where is that prolactin coming from so peter i think you the only one who's attempted this question yes prolactin in the amniotic fluid is coming from decidua this is 
decidual prolactin. This is not the same prolactin as the prolactin that is coming from the anterior pituitary. Now, usually in pregnancy, when you're when we're talking about maternal serum prolactin levels, when we are talking about maternal serum prolactin levels. We are meaning the prolactin levels which are coming from the anterior pituitary gland of the mother. Right? But when we talk about prolactin present in the amniotic fluid, it is little in amount, but it is coming from the decidua, not from fetal pituitary, not even from placenta. Placenta does not produce prolactin at all. Placenta doesn't. And not even from maternal pituitary, but from the decidua. Now, what does this prolactin do? What does this prolactin do? The role is incompletely understood, but there is one role which I think is good enough for you guys to remember that the role of this decidual prolactin, role of this decidual prolactin is in maintaining water balance, maintaining the amount of water, maintaining the water balance in the amniotic fluid so at least this much you should know about the decidual prolactin at least this much okay now moving on further let's focus more on the maternal serum prolactin levels now maternal serum prolactin levels in pregnancy when do they start to rise when did they start to rise so they start increasing they start increasing by about eight weeks of pregnancy okay and thereafter they rise throughout the nine months of pregnancy so if you look at this chart here you'll see you'll see this chart here you'll see the purple line is representing prolactin so you can see here that the prolactin levels they start increasing by about eight weeks so if this is 10 weeks here by about eight weeks they start increasing and thereafter they continue to rise to reach a maximum level at term you see 40 weeks so maximum levels of maternal prolactin levels during pregnancy if they ask you during pregnancy if they ask you they are at term and what happens immediately postpartum what happens after delivery after delivery you can see that the prolactin levels actually start to decline obviously they are not declining in a day but they start to decline as compared to the pre-pregnant as compared to the term levels of serum prolactin so they are still high as compared to the non-pregnant levels but they are lower in the postpartum period as compared to the levels that are seen during term so maximum levels are seen at term and after delivery actually your prolactin production starts to decline with bouts of prolactin secretion or production with bouts of increased secretion occurring because of infant suckling occurring because of infant suckling on the maternal breast right so this is with suckling another spike in production with suckling another spike in production now the fourth thing that we appreciate and we remember from this graph is how long does it take for the prolactin levels to come back to the non-pregnant levels after delivery so if there is no suckling if there is no infant suckling woman is not breastfeeding your prolactin levels decline much more rapidly and sharply and they normalize in about a week so with no breastfeeding and no suckling your prolactin levels are coming back to normal non-pregnant levels by about one week after delivery whereas women who are breastfeeding who continue to suckle their infants 
on their breast. For them, the rate of decline of prolactin is much slower and it takes about many months. It takes on an average about three months for the prolactin levels to return back to normal in women who are breastfeeding right now what are the clinical implications of this information what is the role of prolactin so if you talk about the role of prolactin the one and only most important role of prolactin in the body is milk synthesis isn't it milk synthesis is directly under prolactin control but the growth of milk secreting apparatus see the breast growth has been happening throughout the nine months of pregnancy in the beginning i told you estrogen progesterone responsible for growth of uh, breast ducts and your uh, alveoli isn't it so this is this is the duct system this is your alveoli right so your the growth and development of this is under estrogen and progesterone along with that other hormones like human placenta lactogen prolactin cortisol insulin thyroxin and even growth hormone contributes to the growth of milk secreting apparatus but they, if they ask you specifically milk synthesis then milk synthesis is specifically under prolactin control okay so that's the role or function of prolactin in the body milk synthesis and milk ejection on the other hand milk coming out of the breast ducts milk ejection on the other hand is under the control of the hormone oxytocin that's another important point you do need to remember so two different hormones two different functions now i want to raise a question the question I want to raise is why mature milk secretion happens only after delivery, right? Now, prolactin hair levels have been rising continuously throughout the nine months of pregnancy we just saw. When drug levels reaches maximum at term we saw and indeed after delivery they are actually in the declining trend. So, why does mature milk secretion happen only after the why doesn't mature milk secretion happen during the nine months of pregnancy why anybody what is the reason why mature milk secretion happens only after delivery very good deepa it's because of progesterone progesterone high levels of progesterone throughout nine months of pregnancy actually inhibit the production of lactalbumin the primary protein in the um, breast milk so inhibits the production of lactalbumin and thus uh, lead to suppression of actual milk production in the nine months of pregnancy. But after delivery, there is progesterone withdrawal. After delivery, placenta out, source of progesterone from the body out. So there is progesterone withdrawal and that's your first stimulus for milk secretion and that's your MCQ in exams. What's the first stimulus for milk secretion after delivery? The first stimulus for milk secretion after delivery is progesterone withdrawal and that's another reason why you see that women in the first uh, you know first two to three days after delivery they often say ke humko milk nahi aara. i'm not able to feed i'm not getting breast milk because you know it's only the colostrum that comes out in the first two to three days of delivery and mature milk production begins after three to four days of deliveries you know that time is taken for the progesterone to be completely eliminated from the bloodstream right so that is another reason why this is important to remember so you remember these two things and you'll always remember that progesterone withdrawal is the first stimulus for milk secretion and after that you know after that continued suckling continued suckling you see when your infant suckles on the mother's breast the thoracic sensory nerves are stimulated and they send a signal to the brain and the anterior pituitary releases prolactin in response to that. So the bouts of prolactin secretion, they come because of infant suckling and that leads to milk production. That leads to milk production, right? So the stimulus, if they ask you for continued milk production, for continued milk production is actually infant suckling on the breast. 
right now at the same time because of suckling what happens is that there is a signal that is also sent at the same time to the hypothalamus now it is the paraventricular and the supra optic nuclei of the hypothalamus which are synthesizing oxytocin that's another important point that you should remember oxytocin is a neurohormone it is synthesized by nuclei of the hypothalamus and it's only stored in the posterior pituitary and released from the posterior pituitary so it is synthesized in the paraventricular supraoptic nuclei of hypothalamus and from the posterior pituitary this oxytocin is released it goes through the blood stream it goes to the myoepithelial cells of the breast these are the myoepithelial cells of the breast they contract in response to the action of oxytocin so there is contraction of myoepithelial cells of the breast and that leads to milk ejection right so milk ejection is under the control of oxytocin that we also call as the milk ejection reflex or the milk let down reflex so when these myoepithelial cells are going to contract the milk is going to come out into the ducts and therefore it will become easier for the infant to suckle at the breast otherwise how will the infant with that little strength in his mouth be able to you know extract the milk out from the, all the lobules no they have to come out into the ducts so so that milk let down that is called as it becomes easier for the infant to feed now what are the clinical important aspects that you need to remember at the end of this inadequate milk production right if there is prolactin deficiency like that you can see in shehan syndrome shehan syndrome you study in gynecology shehan syndrome you study as anterior pituitary necrosis shehan syndrome you study as a cause of amenorrhea well if there is anterior pituitary necrosis you see because of uh, sudden uh, hypotension and you know a uh, massive blood loss during delivery massive blood loss during delivery sudden hypotension and shock can lead to shehan syndrome where there can be failure of lactation failure of lactation right and inadequate milk production can be because of infrequent suckling right if a woman does not adequately you know keep on put you know the women are after delivery are you know counsel to feed their babies every 2 hours basically to feed on demand and even if the baby is not demanding then every 2 hours both good for the baby as well as for stimulating the production of milk so infrequent suckling or stress and anxiety stress and anxiety can lead to inadequate milk production as well right and aisha you are saying even without suckling yes sometimes there can be milk ejection because oxytocin can also be released by the sound of the baby crying you see you know and uh, the, the the just you know, sometimes even with the smell of the baby so yes milk ejection can also happen with the other stimuli like just the sound of the baby crying also can stimulate milk ejection reflex because that can also stimulate oxytocin release from the uh, hypothalamus now to improve milk production what will we need to do for so supposing for example if there is a woman who is complaining of inadequate milk production what do you do to improve milk production the first thing that you will tell her to promote frequent suckling isn't it the first thing that you'll tell her is promote frequent suckling and other than that you can use drugs like dopamine antagonists can anybody tell me why these dopamine antagonists will work i've given you the answer i want to know the reason why you think that dopamine antagonists are going to work to pro promote to promote milk production why is that you see here it is the anterior pituitary which is releasing prolactin and your hypothalamus which is releasing dopamine and dopamine actually inhibits the pituitary release of prolactin the one hormone from the anterior pituitary which is under inhibitory control of from the hypothalamus is prolactin hormone right so dopamine release from hypothalamus can inhibit the pituitary production and release of prolactin so dopamine antagonist 
if you give drugs which are going to act against the action of dopamine right then they are going to increase the prolactin secretion so drugs like metoclopramide and domperidone can be also be used but yes of course first you have to try promoting frequent suckling and on the other hand to suppress milk production what will be required the primary thing that you will tell a woman to suppress milk production for example in a situation where a woman delivered a baby and unfortunately the baby did not survive okay or maybe a stillbirth okay then you need to suppress milk production in that case so the first and foremost advice that you will give her is not to fondle the breast at all to stop breast milk expression at all because she will have some tightness and tenseness of the breast because of milk production but she is not supposed to express or evacuate her breast because it will just be like it will be just like anal and it will be analog uh, analogous to um it will be as similar to uh, you know evacuating the breast as in suckling right so the more she is going to express the more out the more it will form so she has to stop breast milk suppression and for the pain and everything she can be given pain relief medication she can tie a tight uh, you know uh, cloth around her breast as well and other than that yes uh, dopamine agonists can be used like cabergoline and bromocriptine usually uh, we use cabergoline in a dose of uh, 1.5 mg single dose okay so this one is there cabergoline is our drug of choice there so that can be used okay so first of all foremost you ask her to stop breast milk expression good support pain relief maybe yes and yes you can give a single dose of dopamine agonist like cabergoline as well now moving on further what are the further clinical implications of understanding this prolactin business so lactational amenorrhea so we have answered the question as to why there is amenorrhea in pregnancy because of high levels of progesterone estrogen inhibin a contributing all together in maintaining down regulation of the pituitary pituitary suppression and ovarian suppression now what is responsible for lactational amenorrhea then what is responsible for lactational amenorrhea then tenzing i just saw your uh, feedback there tap paridoxin yes used in situations where cabergoline is contraindicated so if cabergolin is contraindicated one can use tablet paradoxin also b long ke naam se this tablet comes one has to give them for a couple of days actually and um, yes that is also an alternative now what's the reason behind lactational amenorrhea guys what's the reason behind lactational amenorrhea what's the reason behind lactational amenorrhea yes prolactin so basically your prolactin inhibits the gnrh hormone production from the hypothalamus gonadotropin releasing hormone coming from the hypothalamus is inhibited because of high levels of prolactin and therefore there is inhibition of fsh and lh secretion from the anterior pituitary therefore there is inhibition of follicular growth and ovulation now this is the reason for lactational amenorrhea now one thing that you can appreciate from the trends of prolactin secretion after delivery is that a time will come a time will come when your prolactin levels are because they're continuously declining so time will come when this lactational amenorrhea will no longer be protective well it is never 100% protective right so the protection for lamb the protection of lactational amenorrhea against pregnancy that means the contraceptive efficacy of lamb first of all it is never 100% secondly it is only about 98% effective and only as long as the woman has amenorrhea that means she has not started menstruating as long as only the first 6 months after delivery and as long as she is exclusively breastfeeding including nighttime feeds 
because as and when she is suckling you know as and when she is breastfeeding that is responsible for the bouts of prolactin secretion so a woman who is not exclusively breastfeeding no protection from lamb a woman who has gone beyond 6 months of uh, delivery and she might still be amenorrheic but she will still not be protected against pregnancy all right so these are the criteria that should be there all should be there for lactational amenorrhea to give a protection against pregnancy or to give a contraceptive efficacy all of these should be there okay if a woman is not exclusively breastfeeding she is not protected against pregnancy if a woman has crossed 6 months even if she might be amenorrheic she is not protected against pregnancy so the question arises the question arises that how long after delivery does ovarian function return how soon after delivery does ovarian function return right so as the prolactin levels continue to decline after delivery a time will come when the inhibition that is caused by increased prolactin levels will be lifted off and then your ovarian function will begin so return of ovarian function after delivery depends upon whether the woman is breastfeeding or not because if she is not breastfeeding then those bouts of prolactin secretion are not there and your Uh, levels of prolactin decline much rapidly so women who are not breastfeeding they begin to ovulate after about 3 weeks postpartum and they will resume their menses in another 6 to 8 weeks okay by 6 to 8 weeks they will resume their menses and if a woman who is breastfeeding she might begin to ovulate as early as 10 weeks as early as 10 weeks she might begin to ovulate and your ovulation can precede your actual menses so having amenorrhea after lactation after delivery is no protection no 100% protection against pregnancy so what is important to remember here is the clinical implication is that women who are not breastfeeding they should start some form of contraception in the third week after delivery third week after delivery and women who are breastfeeding they should start some contraception in the third month postpartum or in the third month after delivery so this we call as the rule of 3 so you can remember it as 3 weeks and 3 months okay so rule of 3 there right so 3 weeks after delivery if she is not breastfeeding one needs to start contraception 3 months after delivery if she is breastfeeding she needs to start some form of contraception clear on this Yes Deepa you are rightly pointing out that even in amenorrhea in lactation if she is lactating she is breastfeeding she is amenorrheic she can ovulate and she might begin to ovulate as early as 10 weeks after delivery so you see can begin as early as 10 weeks but it is not always absolute you see it is not always absolute yeah. so one has to take into consideration that yes there is a possibility that she can begin to ovulate as early as 10 weeks so therefore she should start some form of contraception in the third month after delivery and therefore women who are not breastfeeding they should start some contraception in the third week after delivery because they can ovulate uh, after 3 3 weeks postpartum only okay now uttam what's your question here my last question uh, question in last lecture is hypothalamic amenorrhea role of gnrh agonist okay so if there so this is something which is off the topic but now i have finished off the session for your uh, i'll just take up your doubts in a moment uh, so this is about your endocrinology of uh, pregnancy and lactation we've considered the important hormones and we've 
encapsulated all the roles together in one place so it becomes easier for you to revise eventually so that was my goal there apart from this tomorrow and day after tomorrow and day after guys on youtube same time at 4 pm i will be taking up physiological changes in pregnancy so like I told you that I'll have a separate session on maternal adaptations, physiological changes in pregnancy and their clinical implications. So this will be my focus in the next subsequent two sessions. I will be taking it up in two sessions. Okay. So tomorrow and day after YouTube, same time 4 p.m. And there is a special class on 18th of January, 8 p.m where I will be discussing uh, prenatal screening. This is a free class, 18th of January, that's tomorrow, 8 p.m. Special class, free live class. You can join me there as well on prenatal screening. And Deepa, can I please deal with mechanisms of labor? Of course, of course, I can help you out with that also. Some of the sessions on mechanism, the detailed sessions on mechanism of labor are covered on the special classes. So if you want them, if you want to see them, please feel free to see them on the special classes. There's an entire session of special classes. These are free. You can watch their mechanism of normal labor, labor in ROP, breach, vaginal delivery, clinical presentations, obstructed labor. So all of this in detail has been covered on the special classes. So please, you can check them out there as well. And now Uttam coming to your query. If there is hypothalamic aminoria, you're asking what is the role of GNRH agonist? If you're going to give an agonist to stimulate the uh, hypothalamus, it is possible, but then you'll have to give it in a pulsatile manner so yes when you use pulsatile GnRH because the natural production of GnRH is also pulsatile in nature only pulsatile GnRH is going to stimulate the pituitary gland so if you have hypothalamic aminoria and you want to achieve ovulation induction I mean, I'm just putting a form to that. If there's hypothalamic aminoria, you want to achieve ovulation induction. What are your options? You can give, you can do one thing. You can give pulsatile GnRH therapy, pulsatile GnRH therapy and agonist you'll have to give. So GnRH agonist that is used in that circumstances, leoprolide, often used as leoprolide in a pulsatile low dose manner. Okay, or you also have the option of directly stimulating the pituitary. You can use gonadotropins to directly stimulate the pituitary as well. Right, Uttam? So that is one possibility. The other situation with hypothalamic aminoria is if she's not wanting to conceive, I mean, she's hypothalamic aminoria, but she's not wanting to conceive. She doesn't want to conceive right now. So her concern with us is that we, because she is aminorian, that to hypothalamic aminoria, she has estrogen deficiency. So I want to counter her estrogen deficiency. I don't want to induce ovulation in her. Then in that situation, you know, I can treat her with, for the estrogen deficiency, I can treat her with uh, estrogen plus progesterone. I will use oral contraceptive pills that will give her periods also. Actually, they will not give her periods, but they will give her a withdrawal bleeding not actual periods they will not be true periods but if that is the case i can give her occipital treatment that will take care of the estrogen deficiency and i have to give progesterone along with it so that i don't make the endometrium hyperplastic so these are the two situations i can think of with hypothalamic aminoria uttam is that clear any further question is uh, uh, am i getting it right what you're trying to ask me here So if there are no further questions, yes, thank you Uttam so much. Now I would like to end the session for today and you can check out the plus courses on the platform. Like I told you, there's a long list of uh, labor sessions that I've already undertaken on the special class platform. So thank you so much, guys. Thank you for listening. I'll see you tomorrow, same time at 4 p.m. Bye-bye and take care. Have a great day.